Hey, welcome back. Today we have a small oddball job. I need a special timing belt gear that I cannot buy off the shelf. I have a, a T 2.5 timing belt here and I have the fitting small gear for it here, which is an off the shelf part. But I need a 60 tooth gear for it with a steel hub that has four splines cut into it, or four keyways, like this. So I could of course buy an off-the-shelf um, belt gear, but those are normally extruded aluminum, super soft and horrible to work with, and also you have to <laughs> wait until they arrive here. So I decided to machine a blank out of 7075 aluminum and I glued in a steel insert with Loctite 648, bored it to 15 mm that's the shaft diameter I have to deal with, and now I'm going to cut the 60 teeth in it using a fly cutter on the milling machine. I, I ground this already on the on the tool and cutter grinder to a 50 degree included angle and approximately 0.9 millimeters um, land across here. I will show you in a second where I got those measurements from. Um, and this is just in a uh, 14 millimeter boring bar. I also made this arbor 15 millimeter diameter so I can hold on to this part in the rotary table with the three chow chuck, cut my teeth, and I can pull it off, go over to the shaper and cut the four splines. So let, let's take a quick look at the at the reference book what it says on timing belt gears. Okay, classic uh, reference book metalworking standard in every metal shop in Germany. Okay, here we have uh, timing belts, timing belt gears. Um, that's the shape of the of the tooth gap of a timing belt gear. You have 25 and 25 degrees, that's 50 degrees included angle. You have your depth of, um, of one millimeter and your width up here of uh, 1.75 millimeters and that uh, results in this shape of a cutter. If you take clo a close look you will see that up here we have also a radius. I don't, I don't bother with this radius because the gear I'm cutting is not, not a high speed application nor a high load application nor a high use application. It's, um, <laughs> you will see in a future video what this is for. Um, so I don't bother with this radius, but I have this bottom radius on the tip of the fly cutter. I just used a small stone and ground on a 0.2 millimeter radius, checking it with the magnifier. Just by. So, that's our that's our fly cutter and that's the shape we're going to cut 60 times all around. And the outer diameter of this uh, timing belt gear blank is 47.2 millimeters and that number comes from also from from this table up here. Um, you have your tooth count 17, 28, 60 and the the other diameter for a T point T 2.5 is 47.2 millimeters. So that's let's let's get to work. Okay, let's prepare the rotary table for gear cutting. This is the 100 millimeter three chuck chuck that I tore down earlier this year. Okay, now we clamp up the arbor.
and I still don't bother with the runout of this whole setup. Um, I will align the runout when I get to the last piece and that's our timing belt gear blank. That's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, timing belt gear blank. Let's get the blank on, add a washer and a nut. There you go. This can take some torque. You don't want this, this um, blank slip on the arbor. <laughs> that would be rather bad. Okay. And now we can take a look at the runout of the setup. Bring in a dial test indicator. It's easier to do the setup while the rotary table is lying down flat on the table. As soon as I flip it up in uh, horizontal mode, gravity works against you. Okay, now we will just spin it and get it in alignment. That's roughly two hundredths of a millimeter. Uh, for, a timing, <laughs> for a timing belt gear, that's perfectly fine. Okay, now we need to figure out the dividing plates. Um, because I don't want to use the vernier scale for indexing 60 teeth. That's a bit tedious. Um, I start by dividing 360 degrees through the number of spacings I need. In this case, it's 60. So we need a we need a spacing of 60 degree between each um, two. Um, that makes it very simple in my case because this rotary table moves four degrees for every turn on the on the worm or in the handle here when it's engaged that means for for six degrees we need one and a half turns so we just can take a dividing plate with an even number like um, i will take i will use the dividing plate with the lowest number of holes because it's harder to mess up that way um, with an even number like 20 and that means for 60 degrees I need to go 20 one turn and 10 one and a half turns that's uh, 30 hole spacings and then I will get my 60 six degree division So we remove the hand wheel, get our dividing plate on, okay, that's the dividing plate, now we need our arm with the detent spring loaded and we want to use the most other row of holes which is 20 holes a whole a whole circle of 20 holes you want to set this arm and the detent in a way so it engages the hole and the dividing plate very easy and doesn't bind up um, sometimes a bit fiddly you might notice that i left out the the sector arm because I'm only using uh, two holes. The sector arm gets easy in the way and you hit it with the detent pin and yeah um, I prefer for such simple dividing jobs not to use it.
What I do is I mark the holes I'm going to use with a, with a, with a pen. So I start up here, give it one turn and a half turn, go down in this one. Then I do another full turn and another half turn and back up here. And that gives me always six degrees of uh, spinning on the rotary table. One and a half. One and a half. One and a half. Always six degrees. And uh, you just saw me going back and that's not good practice. Um, the rotary table has of course a minimal, minimum amount of backlash. And if you go over your whole position, you have to back up a good amount to take out the backlash and go back to your desired precision. That way you pull out the backlash. If you just go a bit too far, oops, I went on five millimeters too far and go back, you will end up with precision issues. And nobody wants that. And by the way, that's the nice carrier box I made for all the dividing plate accessories of my rotary table. Comes in quite handy. Okay, I flipped the rotary table up and I already have one screw back here holding it to the table of the milling machine so I can rotate it still around that bolt. And I'm using a small square to give it a rough alignment. Okay, that should be not too bad. I tightened down the rear bolt. Now we can set up a second clamp here and check with the indicator if our setup is good. I set up dial test indicator against the gear blank to check if it's in line with the axis. Just watch. Granted, we have a very short line to measure, but um, that's, uh, that's well good enough. Um, just by aligning the rotary table with the square. I'm setting the height of my tool. I have my height and my surface gauge here on the, on the machine table. And I picked up the center height of, the, of my rotary table with a stack of gauge blocks. As you can also see, but when I go into the center here, the tip of my scribe directly shows at the center line. And I move it over to my, to my cutter. And I eyeball the center of my cutter to the tip of my scribe. And if you have a hard time do that with my eye, use a magnifier. Um, this helps great. This is this is a, a seven times magnification and that's what I use all the time in the shop for. And this doesn't have to be dead knots on. And that's an easy way to set the height of a gear cutter or a fly cutter or whatever. Okay, I already cut the first five of the teeth and the fly cutter is working perfectly. So let's cut another set. Um, we open the locks of the rotary table, we take our index pin and we go one full revolution and half one up to the marked hole in the indexing plate. Relocking the rotary table. I'm running the fly cutter at 1000 RPM and I'm using the power feed.
There we go. 60 teeth cut and it lined up in the end. Perfect. Um, there is nothing worse than doing a dividing job and ending up with a half of a teeth in the end. That's a good indicator that you messed up something while you figured out your indexing plates. So that looks rather good. And if we take our timing belt and try to line it up with the gear, oops, this looks also pretty good. Okay, let's get it off the arbor. We are done here on the milling machine. There we go. One nice timing belt gear with a steel hub. Um, next we'll set it up on the shaper also with the rotary table to cut the four splines. Okay, I have the finished gear set up on the rotary table with four strap clamps. I used some copper shims to protect the aluminum from the, from the strap clamps. And now I have to align the center bore with the center of the rotary table. And I said this early in another video, I like to do a um, rotary table set up on the workbench because it's more convenient as long as it lays down flat on the table. And I have my dial test indicator here. And we will get this guy centered up. I don't want to knock on the aluminum uh, part. I'm using a, a piece of brass rod and I will push the part around by hitting on the inside of the steel hub of the wheel. That way I don't mar up the aluminum part itself. Okay, let's check our run out. We get plus and we get minus. Minus 20, plus 20. Okay, I moved it over. Now when we recheck it, we will still have quite a bit of run out. This is again the high spot. Okay, that looks quite good. Let's tighten down the clamps a bit more. Now we can take this over to the shaper and get it set up for slotting. Okay, this is the slotting tool I'm going to use. This is a, a steel shank that's drilled through and has a set screw on the end that clamps the cutting bit. The cutting bit is a piece of a high-speed steel end mill and I ground it like a parting tool for the lathe with three millimeter width. Um, it's slightly over three millimeter because I need a very very free fit of these keyways. So this is ground to 305 millimeters. And that's all. Don't ask don't ask me about the specific angles. I don't know what I set the grinder to. I have some clearance back here so it doesn't rub on the ground. I have some clearance where the cutter tapers together to this side and I have some chip rake on the front. All those angles are not very critical. Um, you can just eyeball them as long as you don't get them super extreme like 45 degrees. Um, your cutter will work anything between 0 and 20 degrees for a cutting angle will work perfectly. Okay, that's my setup on the shaper at the rotary table that we prepared earlier with the gear clamped to it, set up on the end of the table and I have my rigid slotting head to cut keyways mounted up here instead of the clapper box. Now we take our cutting tool And, uh, uh, yeah, I'm 
we try to get it in. Should be self aligning uh, due to the flat that I milled on the side of the tool, and the cross hole for the cutting bit is machined in the same setup. So. <clears throat> okay, I'm ready to cut the four keyways. I centered the cutter already in the slot and took a very light first pass. Now we check for clearance again, just to be sure. Okay, seems good. Some cutting oil. And go for it. Okay, retract the tool, now we spin our rotary table 90 degrees. Okay, let's cut the last one. There we go. Four key slots, 90 degrees apart. Okay, I'm quite happy how this came out. Um, it's still, of course, mounted vertically on the shaper, but I can already see that it that came out pretty good. And a three millimeter gauge block is a nice loose fit, just as I just as I expected and wanted it to be. So let's tear down the setup and wrap this up. Okay, I deburred the four keyways in this gear and it's done. You will see this gear in an upcoming other project that I have in the shop. Might be interesting. Uh, until then, thank you all for watching and see you next time.